What I thought we'd do tonight is review, first of all, where we were last time, partly because uh, I seem to have not gotten the point across, <laughs> and uh, partly because uh, it'll set the stage for what we want to talk about. Last time we took as our departure Isaiah 19, chapter 19, verses 19 and 20, which makes an allusion that many people, many people believe is a, an allusion to the Great Pyramid at Giza. And uh, we talked about what, some of the reasons why they believe that. And we pointed out that it's a, uh, a pillar and an altar, both on the border and in the midst of Egypt. And basically, the Great Pyramid is in a strange place. It's on the border of Upper and Lower Egypt, and yet it's also in the midst of the, the Lower Egypt Delta. Professor Henry Mitchell in 1868, who was a cartographer for the U.S. Survey, checking on the Suez Canal, happened to notice that, having no biblical background. And, of course, that triggered, not the only thing probably, but it triggered all kinds of people getting fascinated by the possibility that this strange structure in Egypt is somehow a fulfillment of uh, that uh, passage in Isaiah 19. Well, that caused us to then get into a little bit the pyramid. And candidly, no matter how you feel about it, there's no question about the fact that the more you study the Great Pyramid, the more mysterious it becomes. It has all kinds of physical attributes that cause people to uh, be amazed. It, first of all, physically is incredibly well positioned. It's more accurately aligned to True North than the Paris Observatory. It has only three arc seconds of error. The Paris Observatory has six. We're talking about a, a structure that has 13 acres as its base, that has temperature compensating joints at the corners, and that uh, has uh, accuracy of the uh, finish stones of a 50th of an inch. It has passageways uh, cut in it that maintain an accuracy over 350 feet through masonry and stone that have a deviation of less than a quarter of an inch. You have a tough time uh, doing that well today, even with laser drilling. And how they did it is a mystery. No one really has any answers. There's also all kinds of measurements that people have noted that seem to portray a model of the uh, universe, that is, the, the solar system. We have the concave sides that, by taking three different measures, cover the three different days in a year, solar, sidereal, or anomalistic. And people have been baffled by that. They discover that the pyramid is, uh, anticipates several things, that value of pi, many, many times in many different ways. It also is the, uh, the solution to the classical dilemma of squaring the circle. Taking the radius of a circle, that's the height of the pyramid, the pyramid would subtend a square whose perimeter is equal to the circumference. And it all comes about because of a magic angle, 51 degrees, 51 minutes and 14.3 seconds, which is the angle that pyramid's built at. That angle turns out to be provocative for many other reasons we'll come to. And people have taken the various units and seen it as a model of the Earth and the solar system. There are dimensions to the pyramid that would appear to measure the mean height of the crust of the Earth above sea level. It happens to be equal to the height of the pyramid, exactly. The depth of the ocean below the pyramid is a, 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 a number that also can be derived. We talked about the golden section known among architects and so forth, and it's all through the Great Pyramid. So the sophistication of the pyramid is amazing. Then we get to the mystics, who take the passage in Isaiah, in the Hebrew, and add the number of numerical values to that and get 5449. And what makes that number provocative, that happens to be the height of the pyramid in pyramid inches, exactly, and that's kind of provocative. It also is the length of the descending passage in both parts essentially 5448.7360. Kind of interesting. What does this all lead to? It causes one to get fascinated by, and, one, and many in history being totally obsessed by, the pyramid. The angle of these passages is known as the Christ angle for a lot of weird reasons. The angle up and the angle down is uh, 26 degrees, 18 minutes and 9.7 seconds, which some people have noted is the angle that subtends the path from the pyramid to Bethlehem. And there are numbers in the pyramid which add up to 233 and a half miles, the exact distance to Bethlehem. And that causes people to say, whoa, what's going on here? People who have studied the peculiar internal structure of the pyramid, which is not a tomb, it's something else, but no one's quite sure what. There's a descending passage and a strange antechamber. There's the ascending passage and the grand gallery, and then another passage to what they call the queen's chamber, ancient names. Some other passages into the king's chamber with a strange box that's roughly the it's a volume of the Ark of the Covenant. And on it goes. And people have seen certain reference lines in this passage, which has led to the basic unit insights, and it also leads to all kinds of attempts 
to do prophetic dating because it does seem that several inches measures seem to correlate to key dates and yet as people get carried away with all of this and you'll find things like um, the Christ angle and the ascending passage, the birth of Christ, the baptism, and the crucifixion, and on it goes. And there are charts and charts of all shapes and sizes, giving all kinds of very provocative and convincing arguments. And most of them have this basic architecture, that somehow this descending passage into the abyss here is man's descent to death. And yet the number of inches that correlate to uh, the uh, giving of the law of Moses turns out to start the ascending passage. And when you count those inches, it would seem that about the birth of Christ is here and the crucifixion of Christ and uh, his descent presumably up and back. This is usually related to either human life or Israel. This grand gallery is almost always linked to the church in some way. And this somehow some final climax. And all the different authors over the years have all slightly different variations of how they try to make an analogy of this prophetically. However, the proof of the pudding is their ability to prophesy. And Adam Rutherford, for one, is famous for his various charts and diagrams and numbers, predicting, of course, the end of the church age in 1914. Not so you'd notice, huh? (laughs) There are a number of variations of these, and, of course, uh, Russell and the Jehovah's Witnesses and others have, have in their past been overly enamored with the Great Pyramid. So we talked a little bit about that, and my intention was is to make you aware of some of the mysteries which do raise valid scholastic conjectures, but are inconclusive and tend to be occultic. I'll come back to that. But then we shifted our discussion to uh, the Salisbury Plain in England, this this interesting thing called Stonehenge. And as a guy who spent 30 years in the computing industry, I got fascinated with this as many, many years ago and did quite a study of it. And it's a fascinating monument, about a 320-foot circle surrounded by various holes and stones and what have you, all lined up with a keystone called the heel stone, or it's an ancient word for sunstone. And indeed, everyone's noticed for centuries that the midsummer sunrise always rises directly over the heel stone. Now, of course, there's all kinds of structural things about Stonehenge. It is as mysterious as uh, the pyramid, probably built about the same time, two, three thousand years ago. Nothing to do with the Druids. They came later and just inherited and, and went on with their foolishness. But uh, <laughs> these things are carefully crafted with mortise and tenon and tongue and groove and crafted elsewhere and brought here 240 miles away. Some of the stones are weighing as much as 50 tons. So how they did it 3000 BC is a tough guess, a tough guess. But what's perhaps more interesting, if you, as you study the architecture of Stonehenge, even though it looks simple and crude, it turns out to b- betray amazing precision. And there are, people will talk about the bluestone horseshoe, the sarsen trilithons, and then uh, the um, sarsen outside, and the, the, the sarsen circle and the bluestone circle. Two different kinds of stones, some in horseshoes, some in circles. Turns out they're very precisely placed. And um, the question is, what do they mean? And Gerald Hawkins did an interesting thing. He uh, put all this on a computer, ran it against ephemeris, learned all kinds of things. This doesn't begin to tell the half of it. But on these trilithons, these huge stones in the center, they line up with sunset and sunrise, moon, moonset and moonrise, and the great central one. It turns out that 12 of the extremes of the sun and 12 of the extremes of the moon at the critical times of year, this thing correlates with. And uh, from this, Gerald Hawkins discovered not only is it an astronomical computer, but it even had the capacity to predict eclipses, and we talked about that last time. And so far, that's in the realm of reasonably uh, sound archaeology or what have you. But then we have the mystics come along and they uh, notice some other things. Oh, by the way, what, what is provocative is Stonehenge works because the key four station stones that make up the outer circle are at a rectangle. Stonehenge can only occur at one latitude in the northern hemisphere. And Stonehenge happens to be placed within a mile of that very spot, that latitude. The latitude is 51 degrees, 51 minutes, and 14 point you know, it's the same, it's the pyramid angle. It also turns out that the angle of the heel stone from north is that same angle. In other words, if you take Stonehenge to north, the heel stone is 51 degrees, 51 minutes to the summer solstice. That's exactly the angle that the Great Pyramid is built. So that causes people to stand back and say, wait a minute, not only are there a lot of mysteries about the Great Pyramid, there are a lot of mysteries about Stonehenge. Not only that, two of the station stones 
91 and 93 line up to an azimuth of 118 degrees from true north. And if you follow that on a great circle route, guess where you cross? Great Pyramid points directly to it. It also turns out that one of those angles can predict spring. And if you can predict the full moon rise after spring, you've predicted Passover. If you take the line that does that, it lines up with Jerusalem. So you wonder, wait a minute, what's going on? Now, this leads, of course, to all kinds of provocative conjectures. Who built them? Many scholars believe they're built by the same guy because of all the intricate mathematical similarities. A profound knowledge of astronomy being implied by both. So you have theories that Job built the pyramid. You have theories that Seth built the pyramids. You have uh, the most provocative widespread one is that Enoch built it. And that's kind of interesting because that would be before the flood. Some people actually believe the Great Pyramid uh, pre-existed the Flood. If Stonehenge and the Great Pyramid built about the same time, that's a little awkward, because I don't know how Stonehenge would survive the Flood. But in any case, those are all conjectures, and they all have their various proponents. But then again, we enter the mystics, who take the Aubrey Circle, align it with 7,000 years, treat it as some kind of master chronometer, and they notice that all kinds of alignments add up to all kinds of interesting dates. And uh, you'll find books written on this stuff, they notice that Stonehenge will line up, not only does it check with his dates, but those things also line up with the various dates that are conjectured about the Great Pyramid. Again, the mystics jump on the bandwagon and say, gee, they're obviously both built by the same guys. The question is who, and we'll come to some conjecture about that in a minute. Some more recent ones. In any case, you'll actually find diagrams like this in some of the books which have from uh, several thousand B.C. to several thousand A.D. various dates that line up with the birth of Seth, the death of Adam, the birth of Noah, and, and on it goes, including the uh, uh, last possible, Israel's last possible jubilee, and the Punic Wars, and, and uh, Constantine's conversion, and so forth. And those of you that want to buy into this stuff, pay particular attention to 1984, because something big is supposed to happen then. And 2244 is a big year. And uh, watch out for 2730 A.D. Anyway, I hope no one in the room thinks I'm taking this too seriously. Okay, there's two monuments, the Pyramid and, and Stonehenge, and we, we sort of beat that to death last time. I'm doing this for review just to get us back in that uh, frame of reference and also for those that may have missed last time. Then we get to, perhaps, the most provocative monuments of all, and monuments is in quotation marks, because in the Viking flyby on the planet Mars some years ago, it took some pictures, and among those pictures they found some rather strange features. And if you blow up one of them, you get this. And I love to ask, how many see a face there? Okay. Some people don't. Uh, some scientists pretend they don't see anything at all because they don't want to really get into the Von Donneken stuff again. Eric Von Donneken uh, destroyed any credibility to, you know, uh, this kind of thing back years ago with his rather superficial work called Charity of the Gods. And uh, most serious uh, scholars uh, uh, wince at all of that uh, nonsense. But in any case, this feature is about a mile across. And... Um, the more they study it, the more puzzling it becomes, because first of all, it turns out it's symmetrical. And um, to give you another view of all of this, this is it, the same thing in rotation. And um, it does have a resemblance of a face. It is symmetrical. They've studied the likeness, the geometry, the order, composition. The thing that bothers me the most is the symmetry, because randomness does not produce symmetry. We find symmetry in biology and in crystals because there's operative reasons for them to occur, because there's order. But in terms of winds and volcanoes and meteor impacts or whatever else shapes these features on the planet Mars, finding symmetry is candidly disturbing. And of course, there seem to be brows and a nose and eyes and such, and this face, disturbingly, looks like a face. And it looks like a humanoid face, whatever that means. Now, why would there be such a structure on the planet Mars? One of two possibilities. It's either meaningless, as just happening to be some kind of aberration of history, cosmic history of some kind, and most scientists cling to that view. There are some that are disturbed enough by this that conjecture, and they call themselves extraterrestrial archaeologists. Isn't that a great line? Yeah. <laughs> And they, they theorize that maybe there was cultures uh, half a million years ago that built this on the planet Mars. 
And, of course, they're very cautious in their writings, to give them credit. They're cautious in their writings, but they do open their, uh, you know, the thoughts in that direction. And conjecture, they're either natural or artificial. If they're natural, they're trivial. If they're artificial, they're incredibly profound. Now, if that were the only one, it would be probably just a little curiosity. It turns out that they found some other things in the planet Mars. They found one of these. This is a five-sided pyramid. It goes from here, and it's darker. You probably can't see it too well. And here to here to here. Also, the bases seem to be buttressed. And again, they're disturbed. And someone says, well, wait, it's not an equilateral pentagon. That's right. And that somebody noticed that, by the way, there's the famous study by Leonardo da Vinci of the proportions of man. And it's kind of interesting that if you take this, it fits. And so people wonder, gee, is that significant? Or again, is it accidental? And then they go even further and notice that this is but a few of a number of features that are in the area known as the Cydonia region of the planet Mars. The face is about here. This apparent pyramid is here. And it's a little strange because the head of that seems to line up with the face. Also, there's a cluster of features here, some of which include orthogonal walls, walls that are 90 degrees to one another. And that's a little disturbing, because that doesn't sound like something that would happen by random meteor bombardment or something. And the units are interesting, because the units from here to here, taking that as a unit, that's one, that's two, that's four, that's eight. They seem to have a geometric projection and progression. Also, this is north this way, which means these things angle, and they happen to angle at the same angle that Mars is tilted toward the sun. And if you stand here and look across the face, you're looking exactly at midwinter sunrise on the planet Mars. So people get into this, wondering what it all means. So that's about where we were last time. huh? That leads then to some uh, issues having what I'll call conjectures. And one of the conjectures that we're faced with is the dilemma of secular science. Secular science, and I'll put science in quotation marks here, is facing a strange dilemma because recent measurements in the last few years, measurements by NASA and others, of various astronomical parameters now demonstrate that the universe is not infinite. It's finite. It also had a beginning. I mean, measurably so. Let's set aside units and those other issues. The main point is uh, cosmologists are now confronted with a dilemma because the Big Bang models that they parametrically built, they tried to make it look infinite. Even Einstein admits that he fudged a constant, which is the biggest mistake of his career, because the universe is not infinite either in time or in size. It's finite in both directions. That is, in terms of time and in terms of size. Conceptually, that gives the cosmologist a huge problem. Pemrose and Hawking and others all now are beginning to uh, talk about the fact that there is a designer. And that's kind of interesting from their frame of reference to come to those kinds of conclusions, just from objective physics. But there's another problem. In 1957, they discovered the DNA code, and now we understand the DNA code, and it's a digital code. And that has staggering implications for the uh, uh, theories of biogenesis. Because you can't design a computer f- uh, with a digital language until you design the language. And then you have to design the computer to implement the language. And you start building those things so they're not only self-correcting, but self-repairing and self-perpetuating. And you have design problems, orders of magnitude beyond our current technology, and there's absolutely no way they can happen by randomness. The point is, suddenly, secular science is a gigantic problem. Biogenesis is out the window. Evolution would be anyway because there's not enough time nor material to make it work, but that's neither here nor there. At this point, uh, with the digital code and the DNA, uh, the whole concept of biogenesis is in a shambles. So science has to reach for some other conjectures. And one of the interesting conjectures may occur, may occur, and you're starting to see it in some of the papers, conjecturing about why are there monuments on the planet Mars. And this looks like it's going to reemerge, at least in part, what uh, fell into disrepute years ago with the so-called Eric Van Daniken models, the idea of you know, ancient astronauts and all that business. This leads to some interesting questions. As they start pondering this, they come across a couple of rather provocative issues. First of all, if you look at our solar system, it becomes very obvious that there are no habitable planets. Mercury is hot enough to melt lead with no atmosphere. Then we get to um, Venus. 
which has unbreathable carbon dioxide and some sulfuric acid thrown in with 900 degree Fahrenheit temperatures, and that makes it kind of hard to postulate even a biological system of some kind. So that isn't tenable. If you go outside Earth and Mars to the outer planets, you discover that it's even tougher there. And by the way, even, even Venus has 100 atmospheres of pressure. Air pressure is 100 times what it is here. In the outer planets, is even worse, and it's unbreathable. They're crushing atmospheres. And there's no place to stand. They're liquid. You see, that makes it kind of hard to create a, you know, environment of some kind. So uh, the outer planets don't make sense. So the question is, okay, if somebody somehow was visiting the uh, solar system, there's two planets that would be their targets of opportunity. The Earth is the, it would seem like the hands-down choice because it's got lots of chlorophyll, rolling oceans, very habitable, rich group of elements and so forth. You can hear Spock advising the ship's captain that we've got a real target here, except there's another problem. You look at Mars, and it's a, a desolate, arid desert that uh, has unbreathable air and the searing sun with no filtering of the ultraviolet destroying what uh, atmosphere there is, and it's a mess. Except it does have one major advantage. It has one-third the gravity. And as the scientists in NASA and elsewhere understand the role of gravity on biological organisms, they also realize that if somehow you did manage a technology to provide intergalactic travel, that you've got a huge problem, not only with synthetic gravity as you go, whatever mechanism you want to use, but certainly when you land, if it's a long travel, uh, you've got a gravity problem. Well, Mars has one-third the gravity of the Earth. So scientists are starting to conjecture, and they build their models that, gee, if somebody was going to land from far, they might land at Mars first to start getting adjusted to a gravity, which may be a bigger problem than atmospheres and these other things. Well, that causes them now to start shifting gears, looking once again at a couple of other mysteries. When they look at the two oldest cultures on the planet Earth, they notice they're, they're known as Sumer, or we sometimes call it Mesopotamia after the Greek name. In other words, southern Iraq, if you will, which was regarded the, the cradle of civilization, the Akkadians and so forth. It's interesting that almost all the ancient writers, as well as the current analysts, notice that this, the Sumerian culture had no development. The earliest records show them with an existing culture, including representative government, public schools, legal codes, massive public works, gridded cities, mathematics, astronomy, and a written language. And they point out there, was, there wasn't a development. It's as if they had a legacy. And from that point on, history is downhill, in a sense. Now, we as biblical students find that amusing because we've been hammered through, since we were kids with the so-called ascent of man. And now the scientists are saying, well, it really didn't ascent. There was a descent rather than ascent. Well, geez, that's funny. That's what Noah was all about. And that's what Moses said in the first place. But in any case... Then they shift gears and look at the Egyptian culture, and they find the same thing. The Egyptian culture dates essentially about 3100 B.C. with the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt. Again, knowledge seems to have been developed from our earliest records. Not a development, but rather a legacy. And a handful of scholars, and I won't go through all that again, but it's interesting, they also notice something else. There seems to be some links between Egypt and Sumer. Uh, the des the Egypt Egyptians used a decimal system, but they also used a sex adjustment as a base 60 system for the religious affairs. And that's interesting because that's exactly the system that was at Babylon or Sumer, the Sumerian culture. And that's why we have 60 seconds and a minute and 60 minutes and an hour and all of that. And it's interesting. We're finding evidence in the Egyptian writings that they had a similar mathematics, which is a little unusual. But then we start noticing some other interesting things. The... Uh, Egyptians had a fascination for the star Sirius, and they venerated it as the star of Isis. Horus, that's the hawk god you sometimes see in the films, was the son of Isis and Osiris. I'll come back to Osiris before we're through. Horus design is designated in hieroglyphics as Heru, which the same hieroglyphic, which can mean sun, can also mean face, which is kind of interesting. And they wonder, gee, is there some link between those hieroglyphics and the face on Mars? And this gets particularly provocative when we look at Heliopolis, which could be the city of the sun or it could be the city of the face, which is a suburb of Cairo. Cairo, is, uh, El Cairo, is named after the Arabic word for, guess what, the planet Mars. And so they wonder, gee, is there a link that's more profound than we've ever, in, you know, that we've been sensitive to between the pyramid, Stonehenge, and some of these strange things in the planet Mars. Now, this, of course, leads to a whole other set of conjectures that you don't find the literature because most people are not aware of what I'm about to tell you, and that is there seems to be some evidence, not conclusive, 
that the planet Mars made a near pass by at more than one occasion on the planet Earth. And when we studied the long day of Joshua, we talked about that, the models and, and why they were formulated by uh, people like the guy that teaches orbital mechanics at Harvard and elsewhere, where they conjecture orbital resonance reasons to, uh, to uh, view some anomalies between the Earth and Mars, which explains the change in the year and all of that business. If those of you that are interested in this, I'll remind you that this is all covered in a separate tape in Signs in the Heavens when we talk about the long day of Joshua. But the one thing about that, those are all conjectures, but what's provocative are the writings of Jonathan Swift. And I always get a weird reaction when I'm using Jonathan Swift as an astronomical authority, but let me explain what I mean. We know Jonathan Swift is the author of Gulliver's Travels, and most of us know the story of Gulliver visiting, presumably, the land of the, Lillipu the Lilliputians, the little people. That was the first voyage of Gulliver. Most of us, as you've read Gulliver's Travels, are probably not aware of the third voyage of Gulliver, where Gulliver is said to visit a land called Laputa, in which the astronomers in Laputa brag that they know about the two moons of Mars, and the astronomers in London don't know anything about it. Well, what makes this interesting is, is that Jonathan Swift published his fantasy, this, this uh, satire, in 1726. The two moons of Mars were discovered in 1877, 151 years later. The two moons of Mars are very difficult to see. They're, the largest one is only eight miles across, and they have an albedo, that is a reflectivity, of only 3%. In other words, they're almost black. They're very hard to see, except with some very excellent optical instruments. In 1877, Asaph Hall, using a brand new telescope at that time in the U.S. Naval Observatory, made astronomical history by discovering the two moons of Mars. The question, of course, raises, is raises, is how did, jo did Jonathan Swift know about the two moons of Mars 150 years earlier? No. He was a friend of John Herschel and some of the other astronomers of his day, and clearly there was no awareness of any moons on Mars in, in astronomical history. Well, then how did Jonathan Swift... Oh, and by the way, the, the, the account in Gulliver's Third Voyage mentions the rotation, Kepler's, Kepler's equations for planetary motion, which were known in those days, but it mentions the rotation, and one of the moons of Mars is counter-rotating. It's the only counter-rotating satellite in our solar system. And yet, that's the way it's mentioned. And some people say, well, it was a lucky guess. Sure. <laughs> what puzzles scholars is, did Jonathan Swift know about the two moons of Mars? And there's no way that that makes sense. So then how did he get in this book? The answer that seems to make sense is that he drew upon what he thought were legends to color his satire. Jonathan Swift was a satirist poking fun at London. It was a political document at the time. It's now regarded as a children's story, like many of these things uh, turn out to be. But the point is, Jonathan Swift apparently drew up on legends that he didn't realize were eyewitness accounts. And that implies that the planet Mars was within 70,000, 80,000 miles of the Earth at one time. All kinds of problems with that. Well, how did it impact the moon? That means it's close to the moon. That means it rose from the horizon 50 times the size of the moon. It implies that there were 85-foot land tides. As you go to the phenomenology of such a near pass by, that is recorded in history. In fact, there's passages in the Bible that we take figuratively. I saw the mountains melt like wax and so forth. And it may be that those, some of those in Habakkuk and elsewhere are uh, from the pass by in 701 B.C. that also caused all the calendars on the earth to change. So those are all possibilities, and they're conjectures that are in the Signs in the Heavens tape. The point is, maybe, is it possible that Mars in one of those passbys, that the face was visible to the people on the Earth? That leads to something else, and that is, the name for Mars among the Chaldeans was Baal. And when you read in the Bible about Baal worship, you need to understand they're talking about the planet Mars. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 21. Speaking of Manasseh, Hezekiah was the king during uh, Isaiah's time, and Hezekiah tore down the idols and reestablished uh, the worship of the living God. But when he passes away, his son was worse than useless, and that's Manasseh. And he tears down all the proper things and reestablishes idols. In fact, Manasseh is credited by the Talmud as the one that martyred Isaiah. In fact, uh, some extra-biblical records imply that he sawed Isaiah in half with a wooden saw. But in any case, in verse 3 of 2 Kings 21, it says, For he built up again, speaking of Manasseh, he built up again the high places. By the way, interesting thing, you'll notice throughout the Old Testament that idol worship was always on the high places, right? And God didn't want 
Israel to put their altars on the high places because they didn't want it to be like the pagan practices. Something else that was on the high places are the groves. Remember, you always read about the groves on the high places. Idol worship. What kind of groves were they? Some of them, Chaldean ones, were phallic symbols. Others may have been the equivalent of Stonehenge, but in wood. There is a wood hinge in Scotland and so forth. I mean, there's, if you get into that, you'll find those, these things. It may have been astronomical. Because let me, let, let's read on in Second Kings 21. For he built up again the high places which Hezekiah's father had destroyed. And he reared up altars for Baal and made an idol as did Ahab the king of Israel and worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. Interesting. Why would they worship Mars? You and I, if we went out tonight, couldn't, we couldn't point out, most of you could not point out the planet of Mars if your life depended on it. And we're educated in the space age, right? Why do these ancient cultures worship the planet Mars? Answer, it interfered with their lives. Every 106 years, it made a near pass by the earth and caused 85-foot land tides, brought all the walls down, preceded and followed by bolides and meteors, bolide being a meteor that explodes. And there's records of that. So it's, we can at least understand more why they were filled with terror. The city of Rome was built on the Tiber, but 15 miles upriver. Why wasn't it built on the coast? Well, it would make more sense. Why? Because they knew every 100 years or so they'd have 100-foot uh, tidal waves. Why? Because the planet Mars. In any case, uh, verse 4, And he built altars for the, uh, in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem will I put my name. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord, and goes on. So it's the idol worship. But the point I want to make is that idol worship was involved with Baal, and Baal was the worship of uh, planet Mars. A couple of other things. The Egyptian word for God is the one who watches. The word in the Old Testament for Sumer is Shumer, which means the land of the ones who watch. So people are starting to see linguistic links between Sumer and Egypt, and that's leading, indeed, to all kinds of conjectures. Okay. Now, you say, gee, Chuck, that sounds good, but that obviously is secular science bridging into the occult. Who, you know, what really happened back then, at the time of the pyramids, at the time of Stonehenge, perhaps, whatever? And I'm going to suggest to you there's a couple of answers. One of them you'll find in Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6 and 7, 8 and so forth is the famous passage in Genesis of the flood of Noah. And uh, we won't get into the flood tonight because it's something far more important than the flood as part of that narrative. And most of us, if we've been brought up in a denominational church background, have been denied the reality of what the Old Testament actually says. So I'd like you to notice carefully chapter 6, verse 1. It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the Benai Elohim, the sons of God, saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all whom they chose. Strange stuff. What on earth are the Benai Elohim? Well, first of all, that word occurs four times in the Old Testament and is always used of angels. The Benai Elohim is an Old Testament Hebrew phrase for angels. So what this verse suggests is something really weird. It implies that there were some angels that somehow had intercourse with the daughters of men and had unnatural offspring. Let's read on. Verse 3, And the Lord said, My spirit will not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his day shall be 120 years. Verse 4, There were Nephilim in those days. The Nephilim in the earth those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, that they bore children to them, the same became mighty men who were of old men of renown. So the first point is the byproduct, uh, the offspring of this peculiar union were unnatural. The Nephilim. The word Nephilim in the Hebrew means the fallen ones. In the Septuagint version, 
The Greek word is gigantes, which is mistranslated in the English, giants. They did happen to be giants, we learn elsewhere. But gigantes means earthborn. Earthborn. Well, you say, gee, Chuck, this is pretty spooky stuff. Because most of us, when we went through Bible study fellowship or some program that teaches you the Bible, they like to skirt this issue by selling you the idea that these were the Sethites. That somehow the line of Seth were the believers and the others were worldly and, and that this Benai Elohim speaks of the faithful ones. It turns out, though, that that's nonsense for several reasons. First of all, the idea of, I mentioned about the Nephilim was the church position for 400 years through the 4th century. Justin, Athenagoras, Cyprian, Eusebius, also Josephus, Philo, Judaeus, and the Apocrypha, all of them take for granted that in Genesis 6 we're talking about something, some supernatural, weird kind of thing. Julius Africanus, contemporary of Oregon, introduced the concept of Sethites to duck some uh, church uh, criticism, and he reputed the orthodox position, and the Sethite notion prevailed to the Middle Ages. And you'll find in many Bible studies, teachers not comfortable with the idea that I've just gone through. The first point, though, is there's no indication that the Sethites, first of all, were distinguished for their piety. If you look at the last verse of chapter 4 of Genesis... It says, And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enosh. Then began men to profane the name of the Lord. There's a mistranslation in many English Bibles that said to call upon the name of the Lord. That's not what it says. Enosh was a bad apple. He was the one that started the downward trend. He was a Sethite. The Sethites were not necessarily godly. But more fundamental than that, when a believer and unbeliever have a child, the child is not biologically abnormal, Right? So the point is the concept of the so-called line of Seth idea is it's very economic with the truth, okay, as Ben Franklin might say. Now, what are and what were these Nephilim, the fallen ones? The word Nephal means, it comes from the root, Nephilim comes from Nephal to, to fall. It's the Septuagint Greek says gigantis, which means earthborn. It's interesting, my friends, to notice that our own our Gentile Western civilization traditions from ancient mythology also records this very thing in different terms. And uh, Fallen Angels and the Heroes of Mythology by John Fleming and other sources will recount this for you. You know in the Greek, those of you that have been exposed to Greek mythology know about what they call the demigods, the titans, right? And there's all these strange stories. The titans' origin was partly terrestrial, partly celestial. They rebelled against their father Uranus, which is the word for heaven, by the way, and after a prolonged contest were defeated by Zeus and condemned to Tartarus. And the word Tartarus, by the way, shows up in the epistle of Peter. But anyway, the word titan in the Greek is the Greek word for a Chaldean word called shaitan, which is the Chaldean word for a Hebrew word called Satan. So there's a link, if you will, between these strange mythologies and what the Bible records as having happened. Now, in Genesis 6, by the way, let me highlight something else for you. In verse 9, it introduces Noah. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his tetelodoth, his generations, his genealogy. And Noah walked with God. What verse 9 suggests is that one of the several attributes of Noah was that his genealogy was not corrupted by the events of the earlier half a dozen verses. So one of the reasons God chose to bring the flood was to erase the satanic plot to corrupt the line of man. God had a plan for the redemption of man. He had that in mind long before Adam sinned. God was not surprised that Adam blew it. But God had already conceived the plan of redemption. And God's plan of redemption required a kinsman redeemer. And part of Satan's plot to prevent the redemption of man was to corrupt the seed of man so there could not be a kinsman redeemer. But God interfered. That's one reason perhaps out of perhaps over a billion people on the earth, only eight were saved in the ark. 
whole study of Genesis. If you want to get more into this, you can get the flood of Noah tapes and, and, or whatever and, and study into it. But I want you to put that in the back of your mind when you start talking about the uh, things like Mars and this extraterrestrial stuff, which is going to be coming in spades in coming months for lots of reasons. Now, why am I making such a big thing of this? Because Jesus Christ told you something. He said, as the days of Noah were, so shall the days of the coming of the Son of Man be. No kidding. For you to understand the times we're heading into, it's useful to understand what Jesus meant when he said the days of Noah. So one of the things I commit you to do is do a study of Genesis 6. There's also, in Genesis 6, verse 4, it says there were giants in the earth in those days... Then a very disturbing phrase. And also after that. What does that mean? That's referring to the, at least, to the Anakim. We find that in Numbers 13, verse 33, we also find the bedstead of one of them was 13 feet long, Deuteronomy 3.11. The men of Israel, the the spies, when they spied out Israel after Kadesh Barnea, they said, we are as grasshoppers in their sight, in Numbers 13 and Amos 2.9 and so forth. The Nephilim. One of them, the sons of Anak, was a guy that you all learned about in Sunday school, a guy by the name of Goliath. Tall dude. And you all know the story about this young kid, David, right? He's going to face off to this guy. And he drops the armor and all that stuff. That doesn't work. He takes his shepherd's sling, stops by the brook, picks up five stones, puts it in his pocket. And you all know the story. He confronts the giant of Gath, son of Anak. And, of course, the first stone hits him between the eyes. And David runs up there, takes Goliath's own sword, and cuts off his head. Right? You all know the story. And one of the fun questions you ask your biblically-oriented friends, if David's faith was so great, why did he pick up five stones? One was enough. And the answer from 2 Samuel 17 is that Goliath had four brothers. (laughs) And does that give you an insight into the character of David? He was ready for all five. That's a fun piece of information because you'll discover many students of the Bible are, you know, haven't been sensitive to that, so you can have some fun. But okay, let's, let's leave all the, the Anakim, of course. Uh, that's one reason. You wonder why God told Joshua and the people to wipe out every man, woman, and child in the land. Sounds brutal. Sounds heartless. Doesn't sound like the God we know, does it? He had his reasons because of the Anakim and the rest. So you can do that study on your own. Well, and by the way, those of you that may say, gee, I don't understand this about angels and so forth, let me call your attention to the fact that in Jude and 2 Peter, these things are referred to. The angels who went after strange flesh. The angels that are chained in darkness. The apostate angels. When you study the fall of Lucifer, as we did in Isaiah 14, you know that a third of the angels fell with them. Some of them, the ones that apparently were involved in Genesis 6, are in chains of darkness, apparently going to be released in Revelation 9. Don't want to be around then. Never met a demon I liked. Okay. Okay. Question then. Let's get back to what we started with all this stuff. What about the pyramid and Stonehenge? You're going to run into that all the time. I've tried to show you enough to get you intrigued so you're aware of the fact that this isn't just off the wall, there are all kinds of valid issues that are puzzling sound scholarship about those structures. Fine. But let me remind you of something, just to tuck away your mind. It's after being 30 years in the computer business, there's an expression that goes around the hallways that says, if you torture the data long enough, it will confess to anything. And when you look at the contortions they go through with the units and the uh, a radius of a circle whose circumference is such and such and all the contriving here, some of them are quite provocative, some are quite contrived. And I might point out that Petri and some of the ones that spent their life studying the pyramid before they died denied any sensitivity to the presumably mystical side of the pyramid. Petri's father was a pyramidologist, so was he, and he did a lot of sound scientific measurement. But there's a number of these guys that uh, who got into it said, uh, no way. But let me go on further because there's some other risks that you and I are going to face as we leave this room tonight. I, first of all, would like you to be sensitive to the dangers of fetishes and obsessions like this. And let me give you one that is authentic 
in which the origin it has no doubt. Turn to Numbers 21. Numbers chapter 21. They're in the wilderness. God sends a plague of serpents. When the serpents bit the people, they died. He tells Moses, I want you to make a brass serpent, put it up on a pole. Everyone that looks to that brass serpent will be saved. Those that don't will die. You've got to be kidding. Weird, right? Why is God doing that? For lots of reasons, one of which is prophetic. And we, we get that insight when we go to John chapter 3 and we find Jesus talking to Nicodemus at night. And Jesus tells Nicodemus, As Moses raised the brass serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be raised up, so that everyone that looks to Him will not die, but live forever. It's a model. It's a prophetic model. Pretty exciting. Pretty interesting. Especially when you start analyzing the Levitical implications of this. Brass is the symbol, Levitically, of judgment. Brass was the metal that could sustain fire. It speaks idiomatically of fire, and so brass speaks of judgment. That's why there was a brazen altar. That's why there was a brazen labor. Everything outside the tabernacle and tabernacle court was brass. Everything in the temple, outside the temple proper, was brass. Inside it was gold. Outside it was brass. Brass speaks of judgment. The serpent, of course, speaks of sin. It speaks of Genesis 3. So a brass serpent is sin judged. You mean to tell me a serpent is a symbol of Jesus Christ? In this context, yes, because the letter to Corinthians, Paul tells us that Jesus was made sin for us. You and I have absolutely no capacity to understand what that means. That a perfect, righteous, incarnate deity could be made sin. We have no idea what that means. And we can study a lot and get some insights, but we should start out from the beginning to realize far more profound than you and I can probably get our minds around. But the brazen serpent was a symbol of that. Oh, by the way, it's fun. To, I should mention one thing. If I didn't, uh, this is somewhat, by re, I think, by way of review from last time. But, of course, the story of the brazen serpent comes out of uh, the wilderness, ends up in a Jewish capital in Egypt called Alexandria. It gets tailored into a Greek legend of Aesculapius, which becomes the god of healing. And as the symbol of Aesculapius is a single serpent on a pole, and it actually goes back to Numbers 21, believe it or not. But what I'm always amused by is when somebody was designing the symbol for the U.S. Army Medical Corps, they decided, I guess, that it would be more symmetrical to have two serpents around a pole. And you see that on cars, you know, with as a symbol of medicine, the two serpents on a pole. What's interesting, you need to know, is that two serpents is not the symbol of Aesculapius. It's the symbol of the god of Hermes, the god of commerce. And it's always fun to, uh, to uh, see that the doctors who so proudly present the two serpents are sort of telegraphing, uh, you know, that whole business about the doctor who told his patient that he only had six months to live, and the patient says, yeah, that's too bad because I, I can't pay your bill. He said, that's okay, I'll give you another six months to live. But uh, <laughs> anyway. Okay, I'd like you to turn to 2 Kings 18. 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 4. Now we're talking about Hezekiah. This is the father of Manasseh. We're three chapters earlier than the last time we were in 2 Kings. But speaking of Hezekiah, it says, verse 4, he removed the high place. He did just the opposite of what his son later did. He removed the high places, broke the images, cut down the idols, and broke in pieces the bronze servant that Moses had made. You've got to be kidding. Yeah. The brass serpent of Numbers 21 was still floating around in Israel 690 years later. Why did Hezekiah destroy it? Let me read the rest of the verse. He broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made, for unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it. And he called it Nehushtan, that is a piece of brass. He had to destroy it. Why? Because it became a fetish. Now here's a piece of material that is not in doubt. It's not a great pyramid or a stone hinge or a shroud of Turin or something. It was authentic, apparently, Right? And it became an encumbrance to their spiritual walk. Now that's interesting. I have some dear friends that came to the Lord Jesus Christ through teaching of the Great Pyramid. These people came out of the occult, but they encountered a gospel presentation of the Great Pyramid, one of these variations that float around the community. And from that, were so impressed, came to the Lord Jesus Christ, got in the Bible, grew, and they are fabulous, growing Christians today. And they came to the Lord through the Great Pyramid. That doesn't matter. It still can be occultic. Now, 
You say, well, gee, there seems to be a lot of evidence that the Great Period might, in fact, have some biblical roots. Fine. Let's talk about the Matzeroth, the twelve signs of the Zodiac. Prior to Genesis 11 and the corruption of those signs by the Babylonians, there seems to be some evidence that the Hebrew names of those stars lay out the whole plan of God. You start with Virgo, the Virgin. And that's a fascinating study for those of you that want to get into that. See, the first thing to understand is that the patterns of the constellations have nothing to do with the arrangement of the stars. If you've been to a planetarium show or you've looked through a book, you'll notice there's no way you can get a woman holding a branch and a seed of corn from the cluster of stars in Virgo. If you look at Cassiopeia, it's not a woman chained to a chair. It's a bent W, okay? <laughs> And there's nothing more amusing than to hear these planetarium guys try to tell you that, well, the stars were in a different position thousands of years. That's nonsense. It's not that different. So the point is, the pictures have nothing to do with the arrangement of the stars. The pictures are there to portray a legend that's brought to mind by the names of the stars in their order of brightness. Okay? Now, how do you find out the names? You need the names in Hebrew. Or... Arabic, which is close enough, because some cases we've lost the Hebrew. And you discover that from Virgo around to Leo lays out the plan of God, from the virgin birth of Jesus Christ to the lion of the tribe of Judah. And the twelve constellations, we know them by their Babylonian names. All nations, all languages speak of the constellations by the same names. They all go to Babylon, the corruption of their original use. We don't have time to get into all this tonight. If you're interested in that, you can get signs in the heavens and we touch upon that. And there's several good books that get into all of that. Virgo, the virgin, Bethula, the virgin. She uh, carries in one hand a tzemek. There's 20 words for branch in the Hebrew. The word tzemek is used four times, always of the Messiah. In the other hand, she has a seed of corn, the speaker, and so forth. You learn the names in the Hebrew, take them in the order of their brightness, and they'll lay out the whole plan of God. And yeah, it's an interesting study. But here's again the point. Do you learn the gospel from the Zodiac? No. By the way, the word Zodiac comes from the Hebrew root meaning Sodi or the way. Isn't that interesting? If you know what is the Christian walk called in the book of Acts? The way. But anyway, the Matzeroth in the Hebrew is an interesting study, but it's again peripheral to our interest. Even something that's authentic is dangerous if it takes you out of the Word of God. If it takes you out of the Word of God. Now, you often ask yourself, gee, if I'm getting oppressed by my sin, am I getting condemned by Satan or am I getting convicted by the Holy Spirit? Tough problem. You're really hassled about some sin in your life. It can be one of two things. It can be Satan putting you on a guilt trip, grinding you down. It also can be the Holy Spirit drawing you. How do you tell? Very simple. Is it drawing you into the Word of God or pulling you away? If the sin in your life is drawing you away from the Bible, away from the Word of God, that's Satan putting you on a trip. If your conviction of that sin is drawing you into the Word, that's the Holy Spirit working in your life. When He starts, He finishes. The point is, does the Great Pyramid or Stonehenge bring you into the Word or out? Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't make a hobby of some of these things if you're drawn to it, but be careful. They're occultic. Do they have biblical roots? Fine, that's, that's nothing. Most of the heresies prevalent today are built on what originally was a germ of truth, exaggerated, bent out of shape, and used to destroy you. Satan's goal is very clear, and that's to get you derailed. Now, why did I get into all of this? Gee, we're going to make it. Good. Because of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians is probably the most important prophetic book in the New Testament. Chapter 2 is the kernel of it. And in verse 3 it speaks of the man of sin, the son of perdition, the guy that I will call the coming world leader. Some people call him the Antichrist. That, word has, that label has some limitations. But anyway, verse 4, "...who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God." Boy, that can't be far away, because the temple is brewing. You all heard about the coming temple book. It's also on tape if you'd rather. And, uh, but in any case, the point is the temple is starting. That says we're getting close. It doesn't take any imagination, if you have any biblical knowledge at all, to realize that Babylon's being rebuilt, as Isaiah and Jeremiah predicted. That there's a super state emerging in Europe, like Daniel and Revelation talk about. That there, the, the Soviet Union is the arsenal for the Arabs to invade Israel, like Ezekiel talked about. That Israel is regathered in the land, like most of the prophets predicted, and specifically getting ready to build their temple. 
Boy, it doesn't take... Jesus said, you know the times... You, you can judge the weather, right? I don't know if you were sailors, you know, there's the old thing, you know, uh, uh, red sky in the morning, sailor take warning, red sky at night, sailor's delight. I was amazed to discover that's in the Bible. Jesus himself made reference to that. You can discern the weather, you can't discern the signs of the times. Boy, you and I should know the signs of the times. It's happening. Now, if this guy's about to surface, let's notice what else is going to come to this. And by the way, verse 5, I love it. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. Paul's writing this letter to a group of people he spent three weeks with. These people came off the street, came to Christ, and were the church in Thessalonica. He left, went to Berea, and then to Corinth, heard they had trouble, wrote him a couple of letters. They learned in the first three weeks with Paul, not only the way of salvation and the redemption in Christ, they learned the rapture, they learned the Antichrist, they learned that the rapture would be pre-trib. That's all in chapter 2. And he says, remember, I, I showed you all these things when we were together. It's interesting. Paul laid all this on these guys when they were young, brand new, three-week-old Christians. Kind of fun. Anyway, verse 6. Now ye know what restraineth that he might be take, revealed in his time. That's, of course, the Holy Spirit. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now hindereth will hinder until he be taken out of the way. It's a person. Who's hindering the mystery of iniquity? The Holy Spirit. In his unique, peculiar role with the church that Paul talks about so eloquently in Ephesians and elsewhere. And after he's taken away, then shall the wicked one be revealed. Don't waste your time trying to figure out who the Antichrist is. You will not know if you're in Christ because you're going to be out of here. In fact, you've got to be out of here before he can be revealed, according to Paul in verse 8. Whom the Lord shall consume, he, then he, he adds this uh, identity, whom the Lord shall con, uh, consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. And boy, we're not ready for that. Even Israel, who's expecting a Messiah, is expecting a political leader to bring him to the temple. Not expecting someone with supernatural powers. Not expecting the Son of God, as Isaiah talked about and others. They're expecting simply a political leader. What are the Muslims? What is Islam looking for? The last Mahdi. This guy is going to have all power and signs and lying wonders. Boy, the world's not ready for that. To do miracles? You've got to be kidding. Verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. For this cause, get this verse 11, that's our verse for tonight. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Not a lie, the lie. Definite article. This is going to be quite a lie. And I don't want to presume on you that I've got some inside word that I know what the lie is. I have my conjectures, and like most of my conjectures, they're probably wrong. Acts 17, 11 still applies. Search the Scriptures and prove these things to yourself. But the point is, just for one possible scenario, because it will be useful to think about, suppose the Mars mission in 1992 or 1994, depending on whether you're talking about the Russians or ours, goes to the planet Mars and picks up some evidence that these structures are artificial really built by some previous beings. The immediate result of that will be the throwing out of the window of all of Western civilization and the passing by our whole biblical tradition as just some quaint legends. The idea that we were somehow spawned as a colony of some intergalactic travelers will be appealing, especially in our space age, extraterrestrial occultic New Age mentality. Then surface some leader who's got a connection. And boy, you're set up for the lie. Now here's the key point. For this cause shall God send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all might be judged who believe not the truth, who had pleasure in unrighteousness. There is a delusion. Let me tell you, frankly, if I want to take the time, I could sell you the pyramid story. If I want to take the time, I could sell you the Stonehenge story. And I would be wrong. You'd be deceived. Somebody will come along with much better capability than I have and sell everyone a story that's even more convincing, more preposterous than what we've touched on tonight. Turn to Matthew 24. Four disciples come to Jesus privately for a secret briefing, a private briefing on the second coming. And he gives them the famous two-chapter answer, Matthew 24 and 25. But all I want right now is verse 24 of Matthew 24. That's all we have time for. For there shall arise false Christs and great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. 
But fortunately, it's not possible. There is a lie coming. And it's going to be more preposterous than the theory of evolution popularized by Charles Darwin. There are going to be lies that are more popular than any of the heresies that, is plagued, that have plagued the church for 19 centuries. There is a lie surfacing that I personally suspect will mix together our New Age ideas, which is just the ancient Babylonian myths repackaged in modern terms, it's going to have an extraterrestrial space age flavor and the world will be ready to buy in hook, line, and sinker. Now, one last thing, because we're getting close to the end here, but I have one more slide that I wanted to talk about. We talked about briefly last time. We'll talk a little bit more about this time. I have one more slide of the Great Pyramid. And what I always do before I show the slide is ask you, do any, anybody here traffic in New Age literature? Raise your hand. Oh, you're up to me, aren't you? Okay. Any of you have New Age literature, I want you to turn it in the, in the uh, church office. And what I usually do, if the house lights are up, I have you take out a dollar bill. And on the dollar bill, you will find this interesting little creature. This is the backside of the Great Seal of the United States. The front side has the eagle and the 13 stars and all that stuff, right? Okay, the Great Seal of the United States. What on earth is the Great Pyramid doing on the Great Seal of the United States? To give you a complete story of this one, we would have to recount 3,000 years of secret societies to establish an enlightened democracy among the nations of the world in one phrase. We'd lean heavily on the writings of Freemasonry. Manly P. Hall, 32nd degree Mason, and so forth, the secret destiny of America and other things that are behind the design of this peculiar uh, symbolism. The Order of the Quest, a subset of the Freemasons, which accrued by the merger of the Illuminati of Europe with the Freemason movement. Now, the Great Seal of the United States is all, believe it or not, wrapped up in the worship of Osiris in effect, the worship of Lucifer, the sun god. The design of the Great Sea of the United States was accepted by the, Continental Con by the Congress in 1782, but it was the third try. The first committee on July 4th of 1776 was put together Ben Franklin, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson to design the Great Seal, but they could not agree. So they formed a second committee, and they could not agree. And by the way, one-third of all these guys are Freemasons, by the way. The third committee gave the job to Charles Thompson, the Secretary of the Congress, and his design was accepted on June 20th, 1782. Now, Novos Ordo Seclorum, New World Order, the Anuit co Coeptus, or however you pronounce it, means the announcing the birth of. Now, I don't, I'm sorry I don't have the view graph of the back side, the, or truly the front side, the eagle. The eagle's the United States. Not so. The eagle is the Egyptian sun god Amun-Ra. The Egyptians, the Greeks, and the Persians all worship the eagle as a symbol of the sun god because there's at least a tradition that it's the only creature on the earth that can look directly at the sun. Whether that's true or a myth doesn't matter. It's properly believed by these people. If you look at the eagle on your dollar, you'll discover it has nine tail feathers, which relate to the nine of the innermost circle of enlightenment of the great white brotherhood of the Illuminati. The nine degrees of the York Rite of Freemasonry relate to those nine tail feathers. If you look carefully at the eagle on your dollar bill, you'll notice that the right wing has 32 feathers and the left wing has 33, corresponding to the 32 degrees of the Scottish Rite of Masonry and the 33, the honorary 33rd degree. The all-seeing eye is um, Osiris, again, the uh, god of the sun or of light or, if you will, of Lucifer. Now, what you will see all over the uh, Sea of the United States are 13 leaves in the olive branches, 13 bars and stripes in the shield, 13 arrows, 13 letters in the pluris unum, 13 stars in the crest, 13 large stones in the pyramid, 13 letters in Anuit Coeptus, and uh, so on. 13, this thing was timed so it was approved when there wasn't 12 or 14 but 13 states under the theory that the 13 in the, in the design represent 13 colonies. What blows that apart are the writings of Freemasonry itself in which 13 turn out to actually track back, believe it or not, to the number of Satan. 
And we could get into all of this, but I'll mention the writings of Arthur Schlesinger, his book, uh, The Coming of the New Deal. He points out that Henry A. Wallace, the vice president under FDR, under his first administration, was fascinated with the occult of Europe. And he, after talking to FDR, talked to the Secretary of the Treasury in 1935 to put this on our dollar bill. He was a Freemason. In the late 20s, Henry Wallace was fascinated with a white Russian mystic by the name of Helena Petrovina Blavatsky, one of the major architects, if you will, of what you and I call the New Age. It may interest you to know that, um, well, I won't get into all the politics of the early Congress, but they were dominated with Masons. But the official publication of the Supreme Council of the 33rd degree Scottish Rite Freemasons is, guess what? The New Age. That's their bag. So why do I get into all of this? First of all, I'm not suggesting that you get into the whole pyramid thing. It was not my intention to whet your appetite to get into that whole trip. I really wanted to get into this to, first of all, I believe the way you get immune to something is to get a mild inoculation of the disease. And it was my hope, although I may have been misunderstood by some, that you recognize there are people around that uh, make a big thing of the pyramid and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And praise God, if it works, I, I don't begrudge God can use anything. He can even use Chuck Missler sometimes. Shows you how far he can reach. But, whether you're talking about the Great Pyramid or Stonehenge, you're setting yourself up for the occult. You're setting yourself up to getting involved in the lie, the big delusion. Okay, what's your protection against being deceived? What's your protection against being deluded? You won't protect yourself by becoming an expert on the Great Pyramid. You won't protect yourself by becoming an expert on Stonehenge or the Freemasons or the Great Seal of the United States or the Illuminati or the Council for Foreign Relations or the Trilateral Commission or any of that stuff. No way. In fact, you probably set yourself up to get swept right in to the delusion that's coming because John 8, 44, Jesus Christ attributes the master liar as Satan himself. And boy, Satan can con you. He cons us all. So how do you protect yourself? Very simple. You've got to be in Jesus Christ. The only protection you have is to be in Jesus Christ, to be supernaturally protected. And most of you in this room, I hope, have made a commitment to Jesus Christ. And so you're on a growth path. It's a question of getting in the Word and learning of Him. In the Word of God, not in chambers of the pyramid, however cute they may be. If there's anyone in this room who has not committed themselves to the person of Jesus Christ, you are in incredible jeopardy. You are in jeopardy not just because you're setting yourself up to be deceived by the so-called wisdom of this world, by the occult, by the nonsense that will be perpetrated as the latest scientific thinking. You're in even greater jeopardy than that. God has a destiny for you that is so fantastic that there's no way you can qualify for it. But not to worry. He's paid the price. He's taken care of it. And it's available for the asking. God just will not tolerate the insult of your trying to earn it because there's no way you can. It's a gift. And he insists that it be grace. If you add something to its wages, not grace. So the destiny, that the grand adventure that God has for you is available for the asking. But the name of the game is to ask for it, to commit yourself to him, let him handle it. He can handle the liar. He can handle the delusion. Because he saw it to it on a cross 1,900 years ago. The battle is won. The real question is, is which side you're going to be on.